Hello, and welcome back. It is Bible Scribe. Thank you for joining me this afternoon. This is the second of a series of videos I'm doing on hell, and this is at a viewer's request. Uh, this viewer asked the question, what is your take on hell? Is it eternal conscious torment, or is it non-existent, or is it somewhere in between? Uh, and so this harkens to the views, the different views that people hold of hell, um, and that would also include an annihilation view where uh, some people would say that if you go to hell, you just vanish, uh, or if you're wicked, you vanish when you die. Um, so we're going to look into that in this video. Now, the previous video I did uh, was about the terms in the Bible that are used uh, that often are conflated into the word hell. And so just to give you a quick recap, the conclusion of that video is that there's really two places that it talks about in Scripture and in other writings, uh, early Christian and Jewish writings, that talk about uh, places where uh, humans go after they die. And one is Hades, one is the lake of fire. And so when the word is hell is used, it's often used for both these things in different contexts and is quite confusing. But there's a host of other terms too that help us uh, gather that information. That's in the first video. So if you haven't seen that or don't understand kind of what I mean by that, go back and watch that video as a preface to this one. Because in this one, we will be uh, discussing specifically the lake of fire, as that is the place talked about in scriptures of eternal judgment. And um, so that is going to be the topic of this video. Is that a real place? Is it actually eternal judgment for humans after death in that place? Or is it just symbolic and it doesn't mean any of that? That's what we're going to talk about in this one. Now, I am also going to do a follow-up video after this one that has to do with the arguments people have against the idea of hell and why they would say that they don't believe hell exists or they don't believe people will be tormented in hell forever or anything like that. So there will be information on that. I can't do it all in one video. It's just too much. And so uh, I'm going to save that for the next video. This video, we will focus on the, uh, the passages in the Bible that talk about hell or the lake of fire and the early Christian writings that talk about the lake of fire. And we're also going to talk about what the early church fathers, uh, pre-Nicene church fathers, said about the lake of fire and eternal judgment. And so that is what we are going to do. Uh, let me get my notes up on the board so you can see that with me as we go through. So again, just focusing in on the lake of fire because this is the place talked about where eternal judgment is related in, the, in those passages. So going through the scriptures themselves, uh, I have this verse in Exodus 3, and this is the burning bush before Moses only because I only have this passage even here because it's an example of a fire that burns but does not consume. And because some of the other writings we're going to look at mention that, I just thought I'd include it. I'm not going to go over it, but that's Exodus 3, verse 2 and 3. In Matthew 7, 19, Jesus says, Beware of false prophets, you shall know them by their fruits. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by your fruits you will know them. Now, this just is a saying of Jesus. He, he said it and uh, was teaching that, obviously, this is a symbolic reference to real things. So he's using the picture of a tree that does not bear fruit to represent a person who does not bear fruit. Um, specifically, he's talking to the, the Jews. So he's saying, you know, you are of my tree, my vine. But those of you who do not bear fruit will be hewn off and thrown in the fire. Now, this just is a helpful reference to that fire that will burn in the end. So I included it here. Matthew 10, 28. Jesus says, Fear not them, therefore, or excuse me, fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Uh, now, just so we're aware, 
that the idea of God judging in destruction is common, and it's common even Jesus taught it. So we can't assume that there's no destruction or punishment or judgment for humans that are wicked or any uh, entity that's wicked. But obviously, from what Jesus taught, God will and has the ability to destroy in hell. And uh, so, again, a reference to that. Matthew thirteen fifty. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was cast into the sea, gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore, sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. And so it shall be at the end of the age, the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now, um, so this, again, a reference given by Jesus about the kingdom of heaven. He's using this parable to describe the kingdom. And so he says at the end of the age, and, and Jesus is talking about, as I understand it, the age of the Jews, the, the age he was in the end of at that time, saying that at the end of this age, which was 70 AD, that the wicked and the righteous would be gathered up, hence the harvest that's in other places in the New Testament, and they would be separated, sifted like wheat, or in this case, separated good fish from bad fish. And it says the bad would be cast into the furnace of fire. So again, this reference of being burned and destroyed because of their wickedness, very common throughout the teachings of Christ. In, chapter, in Mark chapter 9, verse 43 to 49, and if thy hand offends thee, this is Jesus teaching, if, if your hand offends you, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go into hell, into the fire that is never quenched. It burns forever, where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. So, again, another reference to this never-ending destruction from which someone who cannot take hold of their weaknesses, their wickednesses, will end up if they don't repent and turn to God for those things. And it says that, that judgment includes a fire that's not quenched. In Luke chapter 13, verse 28, But he shall say, I tell you, I know not whence ye are. Depart from me, workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves without. So this just saying, because of iniquity, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. It Also, just realize, it, he never says you will have another chance to enter. He says, the workers of iniquity will not enter the kingdom of God. Luke 16, and in hell, and this word is Hades, and again, I had mentioned in the previous video, you know, Hades and the Lake of Fire are the two places. This reference is Hades, so it's not the Lake of Fire. But again, just to see, I think this passage, uh, this is the parable of Lazarus and the rich man. And it shows us that the, the normative, normative thought about judgment was a, a placing in the underworld and a burning in torment. Uh, so this, in hell, Hades, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. Seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Uh, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So a torment in flame. Again, the same thing being said again. The judgment will come. John 5, 28, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all the graves shall, all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and come forth. They have done good unto resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto resurrection of damnation. So this talking about once the dead are, quote, resurrected, that some will attain life and some will attain damnation. Again, this is... Um, this is Jesus talking in John 5, 28. James 3, 6, the tongue is also a fire, a world of evil. 
and it is set on fire by Gehenna. Now, if you watch my previous video, you recognize the term Gehenna uh, is Greek, and it is a reference directly to the lake of fire and the judgment of the lake of fire. And so this is saying, just as the tongue is a fire, uh, it, it is dangerous because you have to bridle your tongue, and it is set on fire by hell itself. The lake of fire <laughs> is the reference there. So James 3, 6. And then, of course, Revelation is uh, specifically uses the phrase lake of fire, and uh, so we have a few references here. Revelation 14, 9 through 11, I'll quickly just say, uh, He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have rest, no rest day or night, those who worship the beast and his image and receive the mark of his name. Now, I can recognize that this passage specifically doesn't mention the lake of fire, but it obviously is saying that those who took the mark of the beast in the first century before the time of his second coming, they were tormented in fire and brimstone, and that smoke rise, rose forever. And so the forever makes us think, hmm, possibly that's talking about the lake of fire. That's where they were put after their judgment. Uh, or in judgment, those who worshiped the beast and received his image, in contrast to having worshiped God and received his mark. Uh, and that's in a, in a, a total other video that I've done if you want to look that one up, the mark of the beast. Um, so Revelation 19 and 20, uh, this has a lot of reference to it, but um, note that in Revelation 19, the beast was taken, and, and the false prophet who wrought miracles before him, and the, those that deceived, and, and they deceived them that received the mark of the beast and worshiped his image, and both were cast into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. This is the beast and the false prophet. They are, when they are judged, I believe this also happened in 70 AD, that Christ and his angels won that war, and they threw the false prophet and the beast into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And in Revelation 20, it continues to talk about this lake of fire. It says, Then the devil, after the millennium of a thousand years, and after his time of deceiving nations, will be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. So it's obviously the same place, same lake of fire, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. So this torment, of course, this is not a human torment at this point, but it's saying their torment Satan, Hades, the the beast, and the false prophet, and Tartarus are all cast into this lake of fire in Revelation, and their torment is day and night forever. And then in Revelation 12, 14, and 15, and death and hell, this is Tartarus and Hades, were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found it written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now we have the wicked, those who were not written in the book of life, those who were judged to be wicked by God, were thrown into the lake of fire, and we can only assume that it's the same torment that is night and day forever that the beast and the false prophet and Satan and Hades and Tartarus were experiencing. There's no reason not to think that. It's in the same passage even, same context. So, uh, that is our main, just so you know, that I would say is the most direct, specific reference in the Bible to humans being thrown into the lake of fire, because it says all those things specifically spelled out. Other places it says, you know, the wicked shall taste fire and their smoke shall rise and all this other stuff. So, it, they're less specific references, I believe, obviously, to the same thing. However, just so you know, this is the most direct one that I found in the Bible. And so that is verse 14 to 15 of Re Revelation 20. Again, we won't go into those again. So now we're moving on to non-biblical, um, early Christian and or Jewish writings of, of the time of Christ and shortly thereafter that talk about the lake of fire and eternal judgment for humans. So now we're going to get another take, another body of evidence, if you will, to support this idea of the lake of fire being an actual place, perhaps spiritual, but real nonetheless. Just because it's spiritual doesn't mean it's not real. 
is 100% real, and these uh, will again attest to that. So we have the Testament of Reuben. This is part of the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs. It is an early Christian writing about the time between, you know, they pinpoint. I'm going to give you on each of these books. It's like a range of years because that's how the scholars kind of pinpoint them. They don't say we know it was written on such and such date. It's a range of years where they think it was written. So it could have been the early part, could have been the late part. I'm just going to show you what they've said. I'm not going to get into that. Testament of Reuben for a pit. Un Unto the soul is the sin of fornication, separating it from God and bringing it near to idols because it deceives the mind and understanding and leads down young men into Hades before their time. So this isn't the lake of fire, but it yet is Hades saying that, that the young men who practice fornication will be led down into it ahead of their time because fornication, of course, it's saying is a very bad sin that's destructive. And so this not talking about the judgment in the lake of fire, but I put it in because it's a reference to that same idea of being led down into the underworld and taken there as punishment for the sin that you commit. Epistle of Barnabas. This is a, a Christian writing of about 90 AD. They can't pinpoint whether it was truly Barnabas that wrote it, but yet the early church passed it around and read it out loud in the congregations. So in chapter 21, it says, But the way of darkness is crooked and full of cursing, for it is the way of eternal death with punishment, in which those that walk will meet those things that destroy their own souls. For the day is at hand on which all things shall perish with the, with the evil one. So we, up here we have, this is the way of eternal death, which is wickedness and punishment. And those that walk in them will meet that destruction for the days at hand which all things shall perish with, with the evil one. The evil one, this person who wrote the epistle of Barnabas, if it was Barnabas, then yea. But they obviously agreed that the wicked would end up with the evil one, Satan, in the lake of fire. Because that was the destination of Satan, according to the book of, of Revelation from John. So this person's saying the wicked will end up with, in the same place, in the lake of fire. The epistle or letter of Mathetes to Diognetus in AD 130 to 200 says this, Then thou art placed on earth, and you shall behold that God lives in heaven, then shalt thou begin to declare the mysteries of God. When thou shalt perceive the true life is in heaven, when thou shalt despise the apparent death on earth, and you shall fear the real death, the real death, which is reserved for those that shall be condemned to the eternal fire that shall punish those delivered over unto the end. So uh, this is, again, a reference specifically to the eternal fire of punishment. This is the lake of fire, where those who do not recognize God and do not live after him or try to follow him in repentance, and they deny him, those who deny God, will end up in the eternal fire and be delivered into it in the end. Now we have the Apocalypse of Peter, another early Christian writing, 100 to 150 AD. And this, um, this writing is giving a lot of specifics. It's almost like an, a really early version of Dante's Inferno. Okay, but um, this writing talks very descriptively about places in hell and or Hades, lake of fire, whatever. And so I, I'm including it because, again, it reinforces this idea of punishment and torment in the underworld after death. So it says, Behold another place, and it's talking about places in the underworld. There is a pit, great and full of something. <laughs> In it are they that they have denied righteousness, and angels of punishment chastise them, and there do they kindle upon them the fire of their torment. Then he shall command them to enter into the river of fire, while the works of every one of them shall stand before them. Something is wanting to every man according to his deeds. So they are punished and chastised according to their deeds in this place of fire. But the unrighteous, the sinners, the hypocrites shall stand in the depths of darkness that shall not pass away, and they shall, and their chastisement is the fire, and the angels bring forward their sins and prepare a place for them wherein they shall be punished forever, everyone according to his transgression. 
So again, this being the descriptive of what they considered in the early centuries after Christ, this places of torment in the underworld where they would be punished by angels or demons, if you will, um, because of their sin. Even Israel, the angel of wrath, will bring men and women, the half of their bodies burning and cast them into the place of darkness, even the hell of men. And a spirit of wrath shall chastise them with all manner of torment. Um, and then it continues. There will be a pillar of fire that's sharper than swords, and men and women cl clad in rags will be cast thereon to suffer the judgment of a torment that ceaseth not. Besides them, there shall be other men and women burning in the fire of the judgment, and their torment is everlasting. Again, so just another document that was early Christian stating the same thing, this place of eternal torment of fire. In the Gospel of Nicodemus, there's a portion of this gospel called the descent into hell. It comes about about 200 AD or thereabouts. Again, it's a range. But in that, chapter 12, verse 2, um, oh, this is a section that, I think I pasted the wrong thing in here. Um, however, I, <laughs> I'm going to have to wing it. So this this is not the part that I intended to have here. I think I pasted from another study I'm doing on something different. But uh, just know that the Gospel of Nicodemus, the descent into hell, the piece of it, is about Christ going down to Hades and pulling the righteous out of their rest in Hades from before uh, him, before the time of Christ, from Adam all the way forward, all the righteous waited in Hades for Christ to get there and take them out and take them to heaven. And that was the resurrection. So uh, just wanted to include that as a document that definitely reinforces the idea of the underworld and a place where uh, human souls go after death. Now that doesn't specifically, uh, it does specifically reference the lake of fire in that document. Again, I didn't pull it into my notes for some reason. But uh, the majority of the references there are about Hades, which is a place there as well. All right, so we've gone through, you know, and just so you know, there this was so broad and so much reference material on this that I did not get everything. There are lots of other <laughs> Christian writings that there were early, first couple centuries that talk about the lake of fire and the everlasting judgment of humans. Um, but I thought this was, you know, what I have is a good sampling. And, you know, just so you know, there is a lot more out there to be found. And, you know, I encourage you, read the early church writings, read the, the letters that were being uh, passed around and delivered church to church and read from their um, uh, to their congregations. And you will start to understand this is a pervasive view throughout that literature. So now we're going to move on and we're going to look at the early church fathers. And there's quite a lot of them. I'm not going to um, go through all these lists, but you can see that list. I'm going to pretend that you didn't see that, but we're going to go through some of their writings. Clement of Rome in 100 AD or prior said uh, that those who have denied Jesus by their words or deeds are punished with terrible torture and unquenchable fire. And the righteous who have done good and who have endured tortures, essentially persecution, they will have hope in God and they will not go to that place. So this unquenchable fire and torture, again, the lake of fire. St. Ignatius of Antioch in 107 AD, just remember these dates. I mean, these are people that learn from the apostles or people that are one step removed from Christ and the apostles. They not they had not been reading about this just think about this they had not been reading about these things they had heard the message preached not only by Jesus Christ and the apostles but those who heard from them and the, the message was spreading so these things were being talked about and they were one step removed from Christ himself so let's recognize just how close these people are to that message Ignatius of Antioch 107 AD he has a letter to the Ephesians Chapter 16, verse 1 and 2. Corruptors of families will not inherit the kingdom of God, and if they do these things according to the flesh, suffer death. How much more if a man corrupt by evil teaching the faith of God, for the sake of which Jesus Christ was crucified, a man has, who has become so foul will depart into unquenchable fire. And so will anyone who listens to him. 
Unquenchable fire, again, a reference to a never-ending fire torment. In the martyrdom of Polycarp, uh, written by those who followed Polycarp about his his life and especially his death, which, I, man, read this, read this document if you can. 150 AD is the estimated time this document was written. Polycarp learned from John and other apostles. He sat and listened to them while he was alive. But he said, Thou threatenest that fire which burns for a season and after a little while is quenched, but you are ignorant of the fire of future judgment and eternal punishment which is reserved for the ungodly. So he's preaching. This is Polycarp trying to win over some of the Romans. And he's saying, You are not paying attention because you're ignoring the fire of the lake of fire where you will go for eternal punishment if you don't turn to God and trust in him. And so he says, what, what delays you? Come and do what you will. Tatian in 160 AD, um, he says, We who are now easily susceptible to death will afterwards receive immortality with either enjoyment or with pain. So he's saying, obviously, after death we are immortal and we will either enjoy that immortality forever in enjoyment or in pain and torment. Again, reinforcing the same. Athenagoras of Athens in 175 AD, he says, We are persuaded that when we are removed from this present life and we will live another, better than the present one, or if they fall with the rest, they will endure a worse life, one in fire. Same idea. If you die without God, without being a follower of God and doing what's right, and instead reject him, you end up in an eternal life in fire and torment. Hippolytus of Rome in 180 to 230 AD, uh, in his Refutation of All Heresies, Book 10, Chapter 30, uh, just says, And by means of knowledge you shall escape the approaching threat of the fire of judgment and the rayless scenery of gloomy Tartarus. Again, uh, Tartarus being the, the uh, prison for the angels who fell from God and committed acts of wickedness in Genesis 6. And so he's essentially saying, if you don't respond to the call of God, to the teaching of God and understanding, uh, that you will be put in a place of fire and judgment, and you will be in a similar place to the angels who were imprisoned in Tartarus. So perhaps he sees the lake of fire as within eyeshot of Tartarus itself, which is another place in the underworld. It's amazing. You shall escape, he says, the blood, the boiling flood of hell's eternal lake of fire, and the eye never fixed in the menacing glare of the fallen angels chained in Tartarus as punishment for their sins. Again, saying that same thing about being in the lake of fire and being able to see then the menacing glare of the fallen angels who are chained down there as well in Tartarus. Now such torments as these thou shalt avoid by being instructed in the knowledge of the true God. So knowing and understanding and following God is the key. And in his treatise on Christ and Antichrist, he says, Hippolytus says the same thing, but he is, he is talking about the writings of John in Revelation. He says, Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection on such the second death has no power. And, and Hippolytus says the second death is the lake of fire that burns. So he is reaffirming it. He's stating it straight out that John was talking about the lake of fire as the second death. And in Revelation 20, it talks about the lake of fire, so we know that's true. Irenaeus, he affirmed Revelation 20's lake of fire in his Against Heresies, book 5. You can see down here uh, that he may send spiritual wickedness and angels who transgressed and became apostates together with the ungodly and unrighteous and wicked and profane men into everlasting fire. All right, again, reaffirming everlasting fire torment. Depart from me, accursed ones, into everlasting fire, and they will be damned forever. Uh, this in Against Heresies, chapter 4. The previous was in chapter 1. You can look that up yourself and read it. Theophilus of Antioch in 181 AD. He talks about escaping the eternal punishments and obtaining the eternal good things of God. Obviously, he believes in the eternal punishments of the wicked and unbelieving. 
Uh, and he mentions here in the end, such men as these wicked will be detained in everlasting fire. In his letter called To Auto Autolicus, Autolicus. Uh, chapter 114 there. Tertullian in 200 AD says, uh, again, he reiterates Matthew 10, 28, just stating the obvious that you shouldn't fear people that can kill you, but those who can destroy the soul, which essentially is God himself. And um, yes, God, who is the threatener of fires hereafter. So he's saying God is the one who can send your body, your, your soul into eternal torment hereafter when you die. So be wary of him, not of humans. Don't be scared of humans. And then in chapter 12, he says, but the fearful, says John, and then come the others will have their part in the lake of fire and brimstone. And he refers here to Revelation 21, chapter, or chapter 21, verse 8. So this is Tertullian, I believe. Yes, um, just reaffirming the statements of John in the Bible that we already read that the lake of fire is real and that the wicked will be put there. Clement of Alexandria in 215 AD, four, punished with the endless vengeance of quenchless fire and not dying, it is possible for them to have a period but to their put to their misery. So there's no, there's no period put to it, there's no limit, it will go on forever. Cyprian of Carthage, 252 to 253 AD, uh, he says an ever-burning Gehenna, and the punishment of being devoured by living flames will consume the condemned. So in his letter to Demetrian, in verse 24, he's talking about Gehenna, which we talked about in the last uh, video. Gehenna is a specific reference to the lake of fire in the underworld, using the symbology of the real place, the valley of Gehenna, to describe that to people who you know might have trouble understanding. But this is a lake of fire that burns forever, and it is conscious eternal torment. Um, I will keep going, try to make quick work because we've got more. <laughs> uh, he says in his letter to Thibaris, uh, send the guilty to Gehenna and to set on fire our persecutors with the perpetual burning of a penal fire to pay us the reward of our faith and devotion. So he's saying that God will put those who martyred the Christians in this eternal lake of fire to punish them for that persecution. And um, he says it's the reward of our faith, the martyrs, that they will be punished. If, if He's saying if the wicked are not punished for their persecution of God's people, then what justice is there for us? Who will avenge us is what he's saying. So he knew that God was going to do this because that only makes sense. Felix Marcus Min Minucius, 270 AD, in his letter Octavius, 34, 12 through 5, 3, he writes, Nor is there in either measure nor end to these torments. That clever fire burns the limbs and restores them, wears them away, and yet sustains them. So a gruesome, grim picture of what this may be like. Now, I will say some of these descriptions, we're going to see this one and a couple others are kind of specific about like limbs being burnt off and then re reattached or regrown. I'm not going to get into whether that's true or not. Just these are the evidences of the thought of these first few centuries after Christ, which I believe were correct in that there is a lake of fire and eternal torment for those who, in the end, in their lives, they never acknowledge God and reject him as their creator um, and don't strive for him, that uh, they end up in this horrible place of punishment. And that's just how it is. Lactantius in 307 AD. Uh, there's a lot here in his Divine Institutes, chapter 721. Those who have committed sins in their bodies will again be clothed with flesh that they make atonement in their bodies, and yet it will not be the flesh which God clothed man like our earthly body, but indestructible, abiding forever, that may hold out against tortures and everlasting fire. So I looked as I looked into these uh, early church fathers of, about the the third century and fourth century, they seem to start talking about this where it's these specific things about their bodies, you know, in torment will be burned, but then replenished and burned or tortured and replenished and all this stuff. Again, I'm not going to get into the specifics of that. I don't think there's really, I think they are flowering that a little bit. Um, 
because that's not in, in the scriptures necessarily. The scriptures talks about the eternal fire and the worm that never dies um, and torment. But, you know, specifics on bodies and limbs and all this stuff, I don't know. That's beyond the realm of uh, being able to lock it down with evidence or real proof. So I'm not going to go there. Um, so there you go, Lactantius, I think. Yep. And Arnobius of Sicca in 330 AD. Dare you to laugh at us when we speak of hell and fires that cannot be quenched, into which we have learned that souls are cast by their foes and enemies. Here, Arnobius is actually defending against the same idea that we're still defending against, that hell isn't real. He's saying, of course it's real, even though you may laugh because of the idea. And he uses as a defense, he says, what does not your Plato also in the book which he wrote on the immortality of the soul name the rivers Archeron, Styx, Cocytus, and Frivilegiton, <laughs> and assert that in them the souls are rolled along, engulfed, and burned up? Now, because he's saying Plato even talked about in his discussion of Greco-Roman mythology, which mythology is a whole nother conversation. Was it really myth or was it actual legend of real things? We can get into that another time. But he's using this defense saying Plato even talked about these rivers of flame where humans would be consumed. And so for you to laugh at the idea of lake of fire and torment after death because of wickedness and rejection of God is silly. For although the gentle and kindly disposed man thought it inhuman cruelty to condemn souls to death, he yet not reasonably supposed that they are cast into rivers blazing with masses of flame. So obviously he did believe in this lake of fire, torment for the unbelieving, and used this as a defense in his time, 330 A.D., to convince and tr to contend with people that were starting to think, well, the lake of fire is not real, judgment's not real. Well, and Arnobius was like, nah, -uh, it's real. Cyril of Jerusalem in 350 A.D., if a man's a sinner, he will receive an eternal body fitted to endure the penalties of sins that he may burn eternally in the fire and never be consumed. And even the Savior himself says in the gospel, these shall go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to life eternal. Augustine in 410 AD, and this is the last one I'm going to do because we're getting too late. Now, I like staying with the pre-Nicene fathers, church fathers, uh, first, second, third, and fourth century. I don't like getting past that because I think once the Catholic church came in, you had the popes, you had all this stuff happen, and it really changed doctrine, it really harnessed it with a lot of trappings, so I'd stop at this point usually, but just so you know that Augustine, the church, the father of modern church history, said that hellfire is eternal, and he said that certain angels sinned and were thrust into the lowest parts of the world, and he said, when God says he spared not the angels but that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them to chains of darkness for judgment, Augustine's saying that was true. That was real. It's a real place, the underworld. And of course, that would be Tartarus. We discussed before where the angels were kept um, and would be close by to the lake of fire in hell. Now, I just threw this in for fun because I read a ton of different materials. I just wanted you to know that even sorcerers, if you know the name Aleister Crowley, you know, now don't get me wrong here. Aleister Crowley is evil. He was evil. He was a Satanist, and he worshipped evil. He worshipped demons, and he conjured them. But just so you know, even guys like him in his book, The Lesser Key of Solomon, say, I say he's binding angels into the bottom abyss to remain until the day of judgment, and he says it into the lake of fire and brimstone. <laughs> and then he says here, he's like, he says, in the name of Jehovah and Tetragram, to all these garbage things, I cast thee, a wicked, disobedient spirit, into the lake of fire, prepared for the damned and accursed spirits. So even a total evil sorcerer, Satanist, like Aleister Crowley, believes literally in a lake of fire, and he works to conjure demons and sometimes binds and casts them there as part of his supposed work in the spiritual realm. Now. 
Again, I'm not condoning anything about Aleister Crowley. If you read anything about him, he's evil, he's horrible, he believes horrible things, and he's going to end up in that lake of fire someday, which is the sad part. But I'm just showing this to you to know that there is such ubiquitous understanding of this lake of fire. It is even outside of the realm of Christianity. And, uh, you know, if I had time immemorial and I knew y'all would sit still for longer than, you know, hours and hours, you know, we could go into all of this evidence. There's evidence from other cultures and all this other stuff. So I think today, though, we've given a good smattering from the Bible, from early church fathers, from... Uh, from the uh, from the writings of the early church that were passed around and read and instructed by, that man, the evidence is so overwhelming that they really believe the words of Christ and the words of John in Revelation, that there was eternal punishment waiting for those who reject God in this life, in this material life. Once you eject from your body suit and you, your soul is given a spiritual body, then you will either spend it with God in heaven, or you will be taken to a place of punishment if you've rejected him. And so I don't know how to say it any clearer than that. The evidence was massive here. And uh, in an effort not to make the video any longer, I'm not going to do any other references. Um, but, you know, this took a while to study and get all this information. But uh, I hope this is helpful. I hope to my viewer who requested this, this is what you were seeking is some information from viable, reliable sources. And I mean, we're talking about the church fathers from the first century and second century. They had heard from the apostles and heard from those who heard from the apostles and Christ himself that this was the case, that there was eternal punishment in the lake of fire awaiting those who in wickedness turn their hearts against God and don't come to him in repentance. So I think that that's pretty clear. You know, um, let me check my notes before I just close out. Yeah, the early church just, they all believed and they taught this, that you must repent and believe and live a righteous life to escape the torment of hell. And in fact, they said it that way a lot. Like, stay away from wickedness. You know, do not do iniquity. So we're supposed to not do those things. We're supposed to do righteous things. And, and in so doing and following God in obedience, we're proving our faith in him. We're proving our trust. And so that's what active faith looks like. And that is the, that's how we escape judgment. That's how we escape judgment. It's in belief in Christ. And when you really believe in Christ, you're going to do things that he does. You're going to want to do the things he commanded. Love the Father with your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the first two, right? First two commandments. All the others are summed up in those commandments. So. Um, I hope this is helpful for you. I hope it lays some foundation for maybe your study on this topic. And again, man, we've gone through centuries of information, um, but I've kept it to that really early stuff near the time of Christ and what the Bible says. So I hope this has answered your question. I personally believe exactly what we've read in this video, that the wicked will die and be taken then to a place of eternal conscious torment and that that place is called the Lake of Fire. And it's where Satan and Hades and Tartarus, Tartarus the angel, not the place, and Hades the angel, not the place. There's both. Um, and all the wicked angels will be cast in final judgment in the end. And so um, I hope this is helpful for you. Thank you for your time. And give me a comment if you have questions about what you've seen or other sources of information. Put them in the comments, and if you if you liked it, give a like and subscribe. I sure appreciate you. God bless.